If protesting really worked, we wouldn't be allowed to do it. I'll say it again. If protesting really worked, we wouldn't be allowed to do it. If we cared this much about George Floyd's death, he wouldn't be dead. If we cared this much about George Floyd's death, he would not be dead. If white people were this outraged at the injustices towards black people, there wouldn't be any racism. If white people were this outraged about the injustices towards black people, the country would look totally different and George Floyd would not be dead. What I'm saying is getting mad after the fact means that you were already upset. So I asked the question, if we were this upset and this outraged at racism and injustices towards black people in America, then how could racism and injustices be sustained? Clearly, the entire planet has a problem with how black people are treated in America. Excuse me, not black people in America, us. How we are treated in America. But when the smoke clears, black people, or us, or we, will still be facing the same problems we've always faced. That is, economic exclusion and being reduced to a color that identifies, describes, and defines who we are. You see, when they say the black vote, what they are saying is we must vote democratic. The black vote is a democratic vote. 90 some percent of us consistently vote for Democrats, which means that black voters are overwhelmingly loyal to the Democratic Party. So much to the point that it's almost 100 percent. So you see, the black vote really means the Democratic vote. And even though we only make up 13 percent of the population, when we vote for Democrat, it accounts for over 20% of the Democratic vote. So potentially, a fourth of the Democratic votes come from black people. I mean us. So one could assume that a quarter of the votes could shift the favor for either party. Because after all, when we break this whole thing down, there are only two parties that actually have a legitimate chance to win. And that is a Democrat or a Republican. Those other parties only come out to shift the votes. And as a wise man once told me, to also make a lot of money in the process because they have no legitimate chance of actually becoming president. So I guess you could say they're getting paid to be ringers. Alternative economic structure in the simplest form would be a Japan town, a little Korea, a little Italy, a little Havana, which means where black folk would do exactly the same thing everyone else is doing. Uh, everyone, the reason we never had an economic structure in the country for black folk is for, two, for three reasons. One, we never had a national plan to, and a commitment to do it. Two, is that, that whites are boycotting black communities and three, blacks are boycotting their own communities. And that's why you'll never see a white person get in his car, go down to a black neighborhood on a Saturday morning, get out and go into a black store and buy anything made by a black person. But neither will you see an Asians coming out of Chinatown, mm -hmm. going into a black community, buying anything. Everybody supports their own structure except black folk. But I really want to focus on solutions. I want to focus on actual solutions that are viable for our people, our community, and our nation. There are two things that we are unified on as a people. That is voting and spending. We vote over 90% Democratic and we spend almost $1.5 trillion annually. So as a people, our leverage lies in the vote and in the dollar. Let me switch that around. In the dollar and then the vote. But I wanna offer some viable solutions. I wanna offer some viable solutions. But these solutions will only work if we are unemotionally attached to the system. We must be indifferent about the system, but specific about our results. In other words, our actions must come with demands. The goal of forming new black leadership is to acquire for blacks in this lifetime economic justice, wealth, power, and equal employment of the rewards and benefits of the American dream. Black people are failing at empowering the community, 
because in a competitive society, there are no mechanisms to give voice to unorganized and inarticulate groups. The black community must develop systems and institutions that are focused on developing black leaders. Unless a serious focus is placed on developing black leaders, black people in America will remain uncompetitive in every sphere of influence and power. We are unified on two things. That is the spending and that is the vote. That's where our leverage lies. So if we want anything to happen, we must use our leverage. Now, many people will tell you that we must simply vote, but no one will tell you you must demand something for your vote. If anyone can have your vote without any demands being met, then your vote really doesn't matter. Let me rephrase that. Your vote matters. It just doesn't matter for you. We've been voting since 1870. That is 150 years. Ask yourselves one simple question. What have we actually gained from voting? I mean, what has changed for us since voting? I mean, we are still the most impoverished group in America, and we are still getting murdered by the police in the streets. So you must ask yourself, what has actually changed? Even our health is poor. So we have economic exclusion, we have poverty, we have poor health, we have poor education, and the solution to it all is to vote Democratic, something that has clearly never worked. That things are different today. In America, we see the same unequal exchange of wealth for things that African Americans do not need, like Jordans, fancy cars, Gucci bags, red bottoms. Blacks also give nearly 100% of their vote to the Democratic Party. They are promised nothing receive only photo ops, yet have remained loyal to party voters no matter what happens to them. Black people are still exchanging the best of their human capital and resources for little in return. The unequal exchange continues. But it's never worked because we've never wanted to leverage the vote. We never wanted to leverage the dollar. The most successful boycott was the Montgomery bus boycott. You know why it was the most successful? Because it actually made the city of Montgomery come to black people, excuse me, come to us and ask what we wanted to accomplish. And this bus boycott was really the catalyst for the civil rights movement. But there was only one problem. And that one problem was when the city came to us and asked us what we wanted, what we should have said was our own bus line, our own busing system. But what we asked for was to just sit on the front of the bus. You see, we turned our leverage into oppression because the powers that be that were paying and influencing our leaders had another agenda in mind. And that was the black dollar, not black people. You see, we've always had leverage, but we didn't have the right leadership in place. Because instead of fighting for equality, what we should have been fighting for is equity. It was our blood, sweat, and tears that paved the way for groups like Jewish people, white women, people that belong to unpopular religious groups, the disabled, other people of color. It allowed for these groups to have a stake in the American dream, but not us. So what they did was they stepped over all of our dead bodies and went into a room and made deals at our expense. While the civil rights movement had many successes, it had four specific flaws that we will call out today. First, our black leadership focused its entire effort on achieving integration. They believe incorrectly that by moving symbols of Jim Crowism, and gaining access to white society, black people would gain equality. Two, our black leaders failed in dealing with the problems that were caused by Jim Crowism, like the maldistribution and racist control of wealth, power, and resources in America. Three, there are no long-term planned development for where and how black people were to proceed post-civil rights era. 
Four, our black leaders fails to construct a national network of institution to train new generation of blacks who would assume the mantle of leadership and implement a national plan for black empowerment. You see, the bus boycott worked because it financially crippled the city. So once the financial structure of the city is crippled, now the city has to make a decision. And that decision was to come to us and ask us what we wanted. That was a prime opportunity for us to say we wanted our own. A wise man just told me that COVID gave us the blueprint. We just watched COVID-19 affect the economy for two months. We watched the money cease for two months and they said it was worse than the Great Depression. We watched the country fold in two months, all because people weren't spending money. Do you understand how powerful money is? Not spending was so powerful that it not only shut the country down, but it also made the government start handing out money. COVID gave us the blueprint. You see, what we must understand is that we are the profit margin for most of these companies. That means these companies only break even if we don't spend with them. If they break even, they can't exist. We are the profit margin for these companies. And these profit margins are not great for these companies. You can look this up. The profit margins are not great, but billions of dollars add up because billions become trillions. What do you think would happen to companies like Amazon, Target, or Walmart if we didn't spend with them for three months? What do you think would happen to these companies like Nike, Puma, Adidas? What do you think would happen to these companies if we didn't spend for three months? You see, at the end of the quarter, they will ask two questions. Why aren't they spending with us anymore? And what do we need to do to fix it? This is where the leverage comes in. This is when you present demands. Since we vote in a unified manner, we could potentially shift the vote for either party. Because we vote Democrat almost exclusively, we could take that same power and vote Republican. Now, I know many of you all, well, we can't vote Republican because Republicans are racist. But that would assume that Democrats aren't. You see, the issue is not the party. It's what the party is willing to do for you. So Democrats and Republicans should be the same for us because neither one of them have done anything for us. So at this point, we can be indifferent to the parties, but not indifferent to what we want from the parties. But if we say we're going to hold the black vote, we have to mean it. We can't say we're going to hold the black vote and then still vote for a Democrat. We have to be willing to vote for the Republican Party or not vote at all. That's the only way this works. And I know many of us have been conditioned to think that voting, simply voting, makes it better for us. But I want to remind you all, we have been voting for 150 years and we are still getting killed by the police in the streets. And that's probably one of the easiest things to fix. Unjust distribution of wealth. The root of the problems for black advancements in America is the unjust distribution of our national wealth, power, and resources. Whites own almost 100% of our nation's wealth, power, business, and all levels of government support and resources. This monopoly was created from centuries of exploitation and expropriation of slavery and black labor. A slave life was committed to producing wealth and comfort for their white master. Black people learned very quickly after slavery that unless you have money and power, your freedom is only theoretical. Black people would have a very hard time pulling themselves up by their bootstraps because local ordinances and social sanctions in the North and South restricted free blacks from earning competitive incomes. The socioeconomic inequalities that existed between white and blacks during and shortly after slavery have now become structural problems that are very difficult to dismantle. You see, if we don't vote, 
what it does is it changes the entire landscape of politics across the world. We just saw George Floyd get killed by a police officer and it sparked riots around the world. Imagine what it would do to politics if we didn't vote. Imagine what it would do to politics. It would literally change the entire fabric of politics around the world. Because in this country, it would show every politician that we were serious. And now every politician is forced to make a decision. Because like I said, since we vote in a unified manner, we can tip the scales for either party. So now if every politician wants to win, they will have to cater to us because not voting leaves no doubt in anyone's mind that we are serious. It's not voting because demands aren't being met. It's not voting because we are being treated subhuman. It's not voting because we have been economically excluded. It's not voting as a sign of protest. It's not voting as a sign of a boycott. It's not voting to say, if you want to have the best chance of winning, you must do something for us. And if we do vote, we must vote after clear demands have been agreed upon. That means the candidate that wants our vote has to agree with what we present them. And if they say no, they don't get the vote. If we do this, they will show their hand. They will let you know what it's really all about. Just like if we don't spend. If we don't spend, trust me, things will change. So the next time we get killed in the street, so the next time we get killed in the street by a police officer, just pick a major corporation to boycott for three months. I guarantee somehow, some way, the message will get conveyed and it will stop. Or every time it happens, a police precinct gets blown up. But I like the first option much better. Blacks were involved in every aspect of the development of the American nation. We cleared the land and produced the crops. We raised the food and the children of white families. We fought in every war and developed the land expropriated from the American Indians. Black produced the wealth that whites in both the old and new world possessed and claimed to have achieved by the sweat of their brow. Although black people have contributed so much to this country, they have often been systematically barred from experiencing its benefit, except for a few chosen few, often selected by those with power. In essence, black labor exploitation is the foundation of all success in America today. You see, we don't have to start a war. We don't have to start a riot. We don't have to protest. All we have to do is use our leverage. And the two things we have are our spending and our voting. That's where the power lies. But we start here and we keep going. I'll say this again. We start here and then we keep going because the goal is to get our land back. The goal is to establish equity. Once we become emotionally unattached to the system, the entire game will change for not just us, but the world because everyone will see it's possible. Why out of 36 million black folk after 400 years in this country, you do not have one single solitary black business district in the entire United States. That is naivete, it is insulted, and it's grossly offensive to black folk because you're creating problems for yourselves by not belling up to the bar and accepting responsibility mm -hmm. of amassing wealth and capital, creating economic basis, creating an entrepreneurial class, creating mm -hmm. businesses, creating jobs that will hire your own people, uh, creating money to take care of your own public services, your lights, your gas, your how, streets. How do black people start doing all those things if 98% if, if of the wealth is in the hands of the white uh, power elite? Uh, we, 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 we start working that very simple. We start where we are. We, write, we are right now uh, amassing for, for disposable purposes something like about $380 billion annually. We're about the ninth richest nation on earth. 
but unfortunately, um, that money is dissipated through our fingers. Wait for it. Free Blanche, get money. Come.